What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. In today's brew, we are gonna be taking an ancient brewing method and coupling it up with a very modern style of beer. We're gonna be making a raw New England IPA. It's something that I've been looking forward to ever since beginning this series because Kvike is a yeast that has evolved around raw ales or no boil ales, uh, specifically the strain that I'm gonna be using today, which is Hornendal. Hornendal is the Kvike strain that I have the most experience with. I've used it probably about three or four times now, uh, and it's produced some pretty awesome results for me pretty much every single time. However, I have never ever made a raw ale before. And what is a raw ale? A raw ale means no boil. We're gonna raise it up to a pasteurization temperature, uh, but we are not going to boil this beer at all. Boiling wort really has a lot of benefits. However, there's definitely plenty of reason not to boil a beer as well. So making a raw ale is gonna save a ton of time, first of all. Because I don't have to heat from the mash temperature up to a boil, boil for an hour or so, and then bring it all the way back down to pitching temperature, um, I'm actually saving a ton of time. So that's about an hour and a half to two hours for those of us with 120 volt systems like myself. Secondly, if we don't boil, we're also going to keep a ridiculous amount of protein and uh, nutrient in the wort itself. Because we don't get rid of those proteins, we're actually gonna significantly increase the amount of body that the beer has, and it's gonna have that silky mouthfeel that you typically associate with a New England IPA. It also keeps a ton of nutrients in the wort, which Kvike really need. That being said, we really do have to be very, very careful about sanitation uh, when we're making a raw ale. Not only am I gonna sanitize everything that I have that's touching the work today, um, but I'm also gonna hold a pasteurization step. Pasteurization occurs between 165 and 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and what it is is basically a extended high temperature rest. It's just about as good as boiling and getting rid of microbes, but just to be very sure, I'm gonna sanitize my entire system before we even begin brewing. I'm gonna sanitize all my hoses, my pump, my chiller. Also, I'm definitely anticipating a lot of people are gonna ask, if I'm not boiling, then isn't my beer gonna be full of DMS? Well, actually, no, we're not gonna have any DMS. So long as I don't raise the temperature of the wort up to 180 or higher, I'm actually not going to produce DMS in the first place. The mash is gonna produce a significant amount of DMS precursor chemicals. This is known as SMM or S-methylmethionine, I think I'm saying that properly. From what I understand, SMM isn't really a perceptible flavor for humans, but DMS, which results from the decomposition of SMM, is. SMM is gonna decompose into DMS when the wort reaches 180 degrees or higher. At that point, it rapidly turns into DMS and then you need to boil that beer in order to volatilize that DMS and get it to go away. Um, which happens relatively quickly over, depending on the strength of your boil, anywhere between about 15 to 30 minutes is enough to get rid of pretty much all of the DMS in any beer. But the bottom line is, as long as we don't heat this wort to over 180 degrees, we are actually not going to have DMS in this beer at all. I'm gonna pop up a couple charts here that are gonna explain the uh, relationship of SMM and DMS in a no-boil beer. Thank you to Milk the Funk Wiki for this useful information. I'm really excited to use Hornendal Kvike in this beer because Kvike really evolved around these raw ales. The way that these Scandinavians used to brew beer, um, they never would boil it. Traditional raw ales in Scandinavia are things like sati and kornal. There's definitely a serious chance of not pronouncing either of those correctly. Kornal, though, is the Norwegian version of a raw ale. It's traditionally made in the Hornendal region, uh, where this yeast comes from. This is really the reason why Kvike evolved to be different than other versions of brewer's yeast. So we're making a New England IPA today, which is arguably not an ancient beer style at all. But the real reason is I'm using this raw ale technique to really get a lot of body in there, to really get a lot of haze in the beer, and I'm not using any flaked grains whatsoever. Just like the other Kvike beers I've done in this series, this is a smash beer as well. I'm using 100% barley malt in this, no flaked wheat, no flaked oats, no flaked anything. I'm really anticipating I'm gonna get enough protein from this no-boil technique that I'm gonna have enough uh, in there for the hops and the polyphenols to bind to those proteins and create a stable haze. We'll find out. Um, but I think it's entirely possible to get the same character and the same haze level and the same full bodied character as you would with flaked grains and other high protein malts. So the other thing is how am I gonna get hop character in here? 
Well, I'm gonna be using a full pound of El Dorado today, but we're gonna add that full pound of El Dorado in three different steps. The first step is a mash hopping step. This is a hotly debated thing in the homebrewing community because mash hopping isn't really seen to do very much, but it is a very common thing to do when you're not boiling a beer. If you're mash hopping a beer when you're boiling it later, you're essentially wasting those hops. There's a little bit of science out there though that says that enzymes in the mash are gonna break down the thiols in the hops. This allows the yeast access to these thiols later during fermentation, that's responsible for a significant increase in tropical aromatics. That's definitely the uh, inspiration behind things like Omega's Cosmic Punch and other thiolized yeasts. Um, I don't think Hornendal is going to be capable of that, but we'll find out. It's worth a shot. And I also just don't want to have an enormous dry hop addition in here. The second place I'm adding hops is going to be the Whirlpool. So a Whirlpool temperature and a mash out temperature are very similar. So we're going to go ahead and go straight from mash out into a Whirlpool uh, to extract a nice amount of flavor and a little bit of bitterness uh, using about half a pound of hops in the Whirlpool. And then we're gonna do a dry hop, of course, as well. We'll do a biotransformation dry hop like right as soon as the fermentation begins. That's gonna, again, help in getting those polyphenols from the hops to bind to the proteins get that stable haze and get some of those nice juicy flavors. Before we jump into the recipe, I just want to thank a couple organizations for helping make this video possible. First of all, Northern Brewer. Big thank you to them for helping provide all of the ingredients for this batch. If you're curious about making this beer for yourself, you can find all the ingredients you need on their website. They're no longer owned by InBev, so that's also a big plus. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply. They manufactured the system that I've been brewing on for the last year and a half. Great system, 120 volt and 240 volt options. They are great guys, great YouTube channel as well, so check them out if you're curious as well. I've babbled on long enough, so let's jump into the recipe. We're gonna be using 15 pounds of Golden Promise for the entire malt bill for this recipe. It's still a relatively high protein malt. I think we're gonna get all of that protein we need from the no-boil technique. For our hops, we're gonna be using all El Dorado, and all of my El Dorado is 13% alpha acid. We are gonna be using four ounces in a mash hopping step. We're gonna do eight ounces at a whirlpool at 175 degrees for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we're we're going to be doing a four ounce dry hop uh, on about day two. Uh, and this is going to be a biotransformation dry hop to interact with the yeast, create some nice juicy flavors. For our water profile, we're aiming for a sort of balanced profile here, uh, a little bit of an emphasis on the chlorides, but not too much. I really don't like New England IPAs that are super minerally, and I, it's just a personal thing. I also don't like New England IPAs that have a significant chloride to sulfate ratio because they just feel too full to me, a little too malty. That's a personal preference thing, so feel free to do what you want with this. But my water profile is 69 parts per million of calcium, nice. Seven parts per million of magnesium, 15 parts per million of sodium, 114 parts per million of chloride, 72 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. So in order to get that profile, I'm starting out with seven gallons of distilled water, seven instead of eight because we're not boiling. Uh, so a lower amount of liquid is needed for this beer. I'm gonna be adding two grams of gypsum, two grams of Epsom, one gram of sodium chloride, and five grams of calcium chloride to the mash in order to get that water profile. For our yeast for this one, I'm gonna be using Hornendalkevike. Uh, again, this is gonna be using the dry flakes that were actually shipped to me by Loyal channel viewer, Jesper Falk. This is actually not the isolate that you would get from the yeast labs. This is an authentic Hornendal blend. So it should be really interesting to see if this is different than the Hornendal that I've experienced uh, from the yeast labs themselves. And lastly, for a mash on this one, we're gonna be mashing this one a little bit higher than usual, about 155 Fahrenheit. This is a typical thing you're gonna do with a raw ale. So now that we've got all that out of the way, let's jump into the brew day. I added eight gallons of distilled water to my claw hammer supply 120 volt system, started to heat it up to the mash temperature, and I milled out my grain, measured out all my water salts, and added all those to the strike water as it was heating up. Once the water reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with the grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps and stir thoroughly to ensure even distribution. I also started to recirculate the wort at this time.
I let the mash sit at 155 Fahrenheit for 60 minutes, but 10 minutes in, I took a pH measurement and I saw a reasonable pH of 5.31. So I decided not to add anything to the mash to correct for pH. At this time, I also added my mash hops, which was four ounces of El Dorado. Once the mash rested for 60 minutes, I raised it up to the mash out step of 170 Fahrenheit and I let it rest for 15 minutes. Then I pulled out the grain basket. I then set the controller to maintain a temperature of about 175 for our whirlpool. And I let the grain basket drain for 15 more minutes while this was going on. Once the grain basket was finished draining, I removed it and then I set up a whirlpool by recirculating through my sanitized pump and tubing. I added my Whirlpool hops at this time, which was 8 ounces of El Dorado, and I let them contact in the wort for about 30 minutes. I also was recirculating through the hop spider to maximize contact and utilization. After the Whirlpool was done, uh, instead of heating up to a boil, I just started to chill it down to uh, the actual pitching temperature of 85 Fahrenheit. This was done again through a sanitized chiller. Uh, and then once it was all in the fermenter, I went ahead and I pitched my yeast. No nutrient needed to be added to the spear because it was not being boiled and it had a higher gravity than my usual Kvike fermentations. Not including sanitation and cleaning, this made my entire brew day last less than two hours, uh, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I measured my OG with the Easy Dense, which was technically pre-boil, um, and I saw an original gravity of 1068, which was pretty much right on target. So now let's talk about the fermentation of this beer. So for Kvike in general, fermentation is not too complicated, but there are a few considerations to take when you are planning on brewing with Kvike. Normally with a beer that you're boiling, especially if it's a lower gravity beer, you wanna add a little bit extra yeast nutrient during the boil in order to help fuel the Kvike. However, remember how I said that Kvike evolved around high gravity raw ales. So in this case, we have a high gravity raw ale. We actually have all the nutrients we need. I'm not adding any nutrient to this unless I really see some issues with the fermentation. I really don't anticipate that though. Secondly, Kvike needs to be pitched nice and hot. So I'm actually gonna be, I've been doing most of my Kvike beers about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I'm actually gonna raise this one up to about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm really gonna try and squeak out some more of those tropical characters from the Kvike uh, with a higher temperature fermentation. You gotta be careful though, because when you get too hot, like above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you could start to risk killing your yeast. Uh, we, we don't want that. You wanna basically keep it up at that very high temperature echelon, but not so hot that it's going to risk killing off portions or all of the yeast. So 95 is about as hot as I would really comfortably ferment any sort of Kvike yeast, uh, but it should get us a good level of those tropical characters. It's gonna be a very fast fermentation, so we're actually gonna be adding our dry hops in um, pretty much the next day, uh, because we're gonna be at least halfway through fermentation by the time the next morning shows up. And so I wanna make sure I get that dry hops in there while the yeast is still actively fermenting to get that biotransformation effect. Now, of course, you could probably use any Kvike for this beer if you wanted to. Um, another great option would be Voss. Vox works phenomenally in New England IPAs, and it's just a very fruity, orangey kind of character, uh, and it's a very reliable fermenter. It's also available as a dry yeast from Lalaman, so that also helps as well. But if you want to ferment this as a typical New England IPA with a regular Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast, then go for something like an English strain like Weiss 1318, Verdant IPA, um, or Imperial A38 Juice. I, any of these English strains that are kind of oriented towards the New England IPA are gonna do a really good job for you. I've also heard some good results from S33 by Fermentis, another dry yeast. This is also a good beer to ferment under pressure. The reason why I say this is because you're dry hopping this beer. You wanna lock in all of those hop aromas uh, and you don't want those to be driven off by the vigorous fermentation of the yeast, especially when you're adding dry hops during that fermentation. You do risk losing a significant amount of that hop character due to the extremely fast, extremely vigorous expulsion of CO2 by this fermentation. It can strip all of those aromatics away from the beer and just place them out in the environment. So 
Fermenting under pressure is really not a bad idea for this one. And this is actually something I'm gonna be doing. I'm going to go ahead and set a spunding valve in my fermenter to capture the aromatics after I add the dry hops. The first day or so the fermentation is going to be uh, without pressure, but once I add my four ounces of dry hops, I'm gonna go ahead and put a spunding valve on the fermenter set to about 15 PSI and keep it there. That's also going to allow the beer to carbonate itself. That should really reduce the amount of time it takes to get this beer ready. I'm hoping to lock those aromatics in there and uh, have a beer that is ready really, really quickly. I'm keeping that dry hopping addition around four ounces just so I don't have any sort of hop burn. I'm doing a single dry hopping addition because it's just easier. I can avoid oxidation that way because I'm dry hopping while the yeast is actively producing CO2 and pushing that out of the fermenter. I'm not risking oxidation. Uh, it's just an easier way to make a New England IPA without worrying about oxidation. Uh, so that's what I'll be doing here in this case. So in a nutshell, what I'll be doing is fermenting this beer at 95 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for probably about three days. I think it's not gonna really take any longer than that. We're gonna add a single dry hopping addition of four ounces of El Dorado at about the next day. Basically tomorrow morning, I'm gonna come down here and dump four ounces of El Dorado into the fermenter. Then I'm gonna affix a spunding valve and set the pressure to about 15 PSI. That's gonna help lock in some of the aromatics from that dry hopping addition as the yeast finishes its fermentation. That's also going to help carbonate the beer in the unit tank itself. That way it's ready to serve pretty much as soon as it's finished fermentation. If you are going to pressure ferment or if you are going to affix a spunning valve to a fermenter, be sure that it is rated for pressure, first of all, so at least 15 PSI, and also has the appropriate pressure relief valve installed and tuned to the appropriate pressure as well. Just for safety's sake, please don't hurt yourself by accidentally pressure fermenting in something that can't be pressure fermented in, like glass. So the fermentation of this beer really did go very quickly. That's definitely not out of the ordinary for Kvaik. It went from 1068 to 1017 in about three days. That gave us about 6.8% ABV and 74% uh, apparent attenuation, which is not too bad. That relatively high final gravity is really not all that surprising considering that this is a no boil beer with golden promise and a relatively high mash temperature. So the beer is called The Old Ways, and it comes in at 6.8% ABV and about 38 IBUs calculated. So for appearance of the beer, it's actually a very, very murky haze, a light gold, pale gold color, solid head retention, solid white head on it. The head's got good structure um, and the haze is definitely there. It is absolutely murky. I apologize for the current situation. I am in the middle of a post-wedding party. I just got married, which is awesome. Um, super psyched about that. I made 25 gallons of beer in preparation for this party, and most of these kegs are kicked. And it's like, oh, you know what? I should probably finish this video on this beer before the keg gets kicked. So this is gonna be very quick. So let's talk about aroma. The aromatics in the beer, it's a little sweeter than you might expect. It's um, It's got some tropical character to it, but it's mostly kind of just a uh, little sweetness on the grain there. I'm actually not surprised by that considering I use Kvike. I found with the Kvike fermentation, it's almost impossible to keep those hop aromatics in there. Um, and the pressure fermentation may have already blown most of that off by the time that I actually ended up with the dry hops in there. I didn't leave the dry hops in here very long. I did end up taking them out after like two or three days because the beer was done. You know, the beer had to get on tap for the week of the wedding and that's why I did. I had to rush it a little bit there. But now let's go in for mouthfeel. So as predicted, very, very full body. It's a little bit less full than it was a few days ago. It has a very classic feeling, but it does not have the silkiness, the smoothness, the typical kind of extra character that's brought by adding flaked grains and stuff like that. So there, it just feels more like a full bodied beer instead of a silky New England IPA. And that's because I didn't add any flaked grains. Um, the no boil effect definitely had an impact on the mouthfeel though. It is much fuller than any other Golden Promise smash beer I've done. 
So now let's talk about flavor. Um, I put a pound of Eldorado in this. It's uh, definitely got the Eldorado character. It's nice balanced bitterness. It's a semi-bitter hazy actually, and you know, even though I didn't add any bittering hops or any boil, obviously, additions whatsoever. Um, there is a lot of papaya, a lot of tropical fruit, <sighs> definitely some melon and mango as well. There's a significant amount of honeydew melon in this. Now the Golden Promise is good, it, does, it has a nice base to it, but it's missing that kind of semi-sweet character that it usually does have. I think I might have screwed up the pH drop on this one again. Um, it might be a little bit more acidic than, uh, than I was expecting or than I was planning for, but that's okay. So the Eldorado really has a ton of flavor. Um, I'm actually very happy with the way it came out. It's very tropical, has a lot of that spicy character as well. Sometimes Eldorado gives people like a garlic kind of character. I'm not getting that, it's kind of maybe like a, a little bit of a basil-y character, if anything. Hornendal is an awesome layer to this as well. Fermenting it at that 95 degree mark really made it a lot nicer, a lot more tropical and papaya heavy. I found that the mushroomy character that I get, the earthiness that I get from some Kvikes, uh, definitely was not present. Maybe that has something to do with doing a super hot fermentation. Maybe that has something to do with doing a raw ale and having enough nutrient or uh, having a higher gravity wort, maybe all of the above. Either way, happy with the way it came out, definitely would ferment at that temperature and do that again. There are a few things though that I think I would do differently about this one. No boil is a really cool technique. It was a really, really interesting thing to do. Um, would I do it again? I don't really know. Uh, I don't know if it's really worth the extra hassle to be sure of the sanitation and to wonder whether or not your beer is gonna spoil over time. But for situations like this, where you only have you know the beer around for a few days before it's gone, it's, uh, it's not a bad idea. Uh, I definitely would have redone this beer with a little bit of extra complexity in the grist, something if it wasn't and smash beer, I would have done something like maybe like a flaked wheat, flaked oat edition, your typical stuff. Eldorado is a great hop, but I think it would definitely want to add a little bit of an extra layer on there. I think a hop that would add a really cool layer to Eldorado would actually be Sabro, which has this nice kind of tropical coconut flavor. So add those two things together. You get the coconut, you get the papaya thing going. It's pretty cool. Again, I apologize for the rushing at the end, but that was literally the second to last beer out of the keg. So I'm happy I was able to get it. Take that thumbnail shot, be finished with it. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead hit that like button hit the subscribe button as well and comment down below all of this costs you nothing and it really helps make a difference for me and my channel secondly if you want to support the channel please feel free to pick up some merchandise like this t-shirt as well as many others which are available in the merchandise store down below the description box you'll see a little stripe there i get about 30 percent of the sticker price off of those and it helps support me quite a bit i also have a patreon really huge shout out to my patreon supporters you guys are really driving the production behind this channel even though i might be rushing videos a little bit like this one it still makes a huge difference to me that i have the support so thank you again for that i also have an amazon store which is available down below in the description box where you could find a whole bunch of my recommended homebrewing gear if you're curious about that sort of thing it's a nice place to check out everything on that store is available on amazon and is something that i generally stand behind as a product i also am available on instagram if you want to check that out that's going to be at the apartment brewer on instagram uh, check it out for more frequent content updates and some extra nuggets. If you're still here, thank you. Really do appreciate you watching all the way to the end. So until the next one, cheers. That's the cat bringing his toy down the stairs to hang out with me. My cat brought me a treat. Very nice of you.